Hello everybody. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to VegFest. And thank you for coming to our first presentation of the day. This is uh, Sean Dawson of Barking Kettle Farm. Uh, he's going to be discussing sustainable foraging in Newfoundland. Uh, but just let me tell you a little bit about Sean before he begins to speak. <laughs> uh, Sean specializes in sustainably foraging Newfoundland wild edibles for the local restaurants and surrounding areas. He also sells his harvests and the vegetables and the herbs uh, he grows at, uh, at St. John's Farmer's Market and local food festivals. Uh, you can catch him hosting and guiding foraging tours at the Grounds Cafe in Murray's Garden Center and presenting workshops such as this, uh, workshops on how to preserve and prepare your harvests all over the east coast of Newfoundland. Uh, he's very passionate about wild foods and this beautiful island he calls home and he's always here to answer your questions. Uh, so please let's welcome to the podium. Sean Dawson. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, like Dave said, my name's Sean Dawson. I have a company called Barking Kettle, and I'm pretty wild about wild foods. So uh, yeah, we just uh, got asked to do a little presentation on foraging, so I figured I'd touch base on sustainable foraging, because uh, it's getting more and more popular every year, which is amazing to see. But it's, uh, it's also important to tell people like how to do it and not wipe out any of the crops that we're enjoying every year. But uh, yeah, I'm just going to read out a little bit on the handout, and then I just got a pile of pictures from things I've forged so far this year in 2018. So I'll just go through the pictures, and if anyone got any questions, feel free to fire them, ask me where to grow, how to find them. All right, sustainable foraging new plan. Why forage? Uh, free, that's my big thing. If you don't have to pay for it, which is good. And the cost of vegetables in Newfoundland in the winter time, out of season, is insane. Uh, organic, like uh, how much more organic can you get than something that's grown in the wild, hasn't been touched by pesticides or herbicides, anything like that. It's a healthy activity, it's just a good thing to get your family out. It's very active, you're outdoors, you're in the sun, you're getting to see a lot of Newfoundland. Uh, the best thing about Newfoundland foraging is you, it's probably the best place in Canada because you don't have to drive two hours outside of town to find a, a blueberry or a, a wild mushroom. So it's, you take a drive out to Portugal Cove or Pooch Cove or something, you're, you're far enough reach. Uh, get in touch with your roots. Newfoundland was very, very commonly that people foraged and preserved things to get through the winter. Uh, it seems like it died out a lot, but uh, a lot of people are getting in the back and making jams, pickles, Fermentation's getting huge here, kimchi, everything like that. So you can get really creative when you're, I find, just more so even than growing vegetables. If you pick something in the wild and you kind of think of the most wild way you can use, prepare it. So you get really creative in the kitchen. Uh, you can feed your family. You can pick, there's enough, enough wild harvest in Newfoundland that every family can pickle enough and jam enough, dry enough to last all, all through the winter. Um, Touch base on safe foraging tips. Uh, so when you're getting into picking mushrooms, uh, it's really important to find out what lookalikes are out there before you actually go out there and harvest them. And a lot of people just say to me, oh, you got to know what you're doing for the mushrooms. But really the same goes for berries too, because there's a lot of berries out there that are poisonous. And I think even more so people should talk about the berries because it's a lot more appealing for a kid to see a blue berry or a red berry and pick it and think it's okay. So it's cool to do these things, so teach the adults what to teach their parents, and, uh, or the parents what to teach their kids. Uh, always check your surroundings, so if you're foraging, it's best to like look around, see where you're to. If you're picking river mint in a ditch with a septic drain coming out, you're probably in a bad spot. So you, uh, you always, like river mint, for example, you want to look for running water. Um, if you're picking a place that's just completely full of garbages and needles and stuff like that, like, you obviously don't want to be picking there. Uh, Close to the highway, I usually try to get away from the highway, gas emissions, stuff like that. Um, in foraging near water, be sure running water, and uh, no visible oil residue, so there's no sheen on the water. Make sure that there's nothing been in the water, an old car that was parked there and sank and forgotten about. Uh, ins inspect the area for broken glass before getting on your hands and knees. Many times, I'm pretty guilty of that myself, you just see a good mushroom patch and you run and jump down and good chances sharp sharp rock or a broken glass or something like that from years ago so it's also good to inspect the area uh be prepared for for any types of weather in newfoundland you can get four seasons here in one day so you know you want to you want to pack well uh have enough layers wear gloves when you're uh, forging sting nettles 
Um, if you're taking your kids out, yeah, they need supervision. So like, never always teach your kids to never pick a berry or mushroom unless uh, the adult is with them until you feel safe enough that they're at a the right age they can do it themselves. Be aware of your gear, like knives. Like make sure you don't forget there's a sharp knife in your pocket when you're picking mushrooms and stuff like stuff like that. Just uh, common sense, pretty much. Uh, safety vest during hunting season, uh, that's a good one. In the fall, mushrooms are still heavily out. And I remember the first year I was at it, I was just, I'd be in the woods during hunting season, crawling around the woods all the time. And my dad would tell me, like, you got a vest on out there? So you really, you really got to make sure that the hunters are where you're out there because you can definitely be easily mistaken for something crawling along the ground. Um, study your locations and your surroundings. It's good to know where you're picking. A lot of times I've been lost where you, uh, you know, you get turned around, but if you know your area before you even go in there, you have a better chance of getting out and not being stuck for the night. Um, be prepared. Um, appropriate clothing, harvesting sting nettles, talk about that. When in doubt, do not put it in your mouth. So that's one I uh, preach in all the tours. That's a good life rule for everything, but um, <laughs> if you can't identify it, please do not put it in your mouth. Get your information from a trusted source. So like doing these workshops, uh, a lot of people are getting into mushroom picking now, and it's super safe to do once you get into it. So go with a friend that's been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, the internet, there's so much information on there, as long as you weed out the stuff that shouldn't be on there. But there's no reason anyone should be putting or eating things that they can't identify nowadays. Um, let's see, uh, watch out for poisonous plants is a huge one. Um, I've noticed the past few years foraging that hogweed is growing all over the city. Uh, it's taken over Pippi Park. It's just a mini hogweed, it's not the giant hogweed. But still, if you're out foraging through looking for mushrooms or berries up on, the, up on Pippi Park or going up toward the golf course, it's up there everywhere. Logie Bay, I was in Trapassi picking bay apples a couple, of week, couple of weeks ago, it was everywhere out there. Uh, I was in Whitburn this week, it's out there. So it's something I don't hear really many people talk about, but if you touch the, the leaves or you get any of the, the residue from the plant, on your hand and it's sunny out, it can react to the sun and give you a third, third degree burn. So uh, it's definitely one to, and it's quite a big plant, an interesting looking plant, so I can see people wanting to, you know, go over and touch it. But uh, if you ever get into it, just make sure you get a cold shower right away, and stay out of the sun. Um, another poisonous plant, uh, just to talk about berries, nightshade, which is a, a poisonous berry that grows here everywhere, it's red. Got little flowers like a tomato, but uh, they're purple. They're in the same family as tomatoes, but uh, they're they're highly poisonous, and I can see kids getting those pretty easy. So it's a good one to preach to your kids. Um, the blue bead lily is a really nice looking lily that you see in the woods now, and they're right at the same time as blueberries. So I can see if you didn't really know or you weren't uh, you weren't into it too much, I can see you eating a few of those, even though they're supposedly really not taste good. And uh, the leaves are edible, actually, so I can see people getting confused with them. Um, sustainable harvesting practices. When harvesting berries, never use a berry picker. I know in Newfoundland, it's like a really common thing for people to use berry pickers. And people, years ago, people used to do it. But it can be really harmful on the plants. You're scraping off the buds. You're taking away way too many leaves. Like, the plant needs photosynthesis. Um, you're probably going to make for a terrible berry patch the next year. So why why not do it? And it's just so much more cleaning when you when you take it home and you use a berry picker. You got to take out all the leaves, and it's just in my opinion it makes the job longer. Feels like uh, feels like you're doing yourself a favor, but you're not. Um, leave at least 10 to 15 percent of what you're harvesting uh, untouched. So that goes for berry patches. Uh, you want you want to leave enough for like animals to eat them, carry them, drop the seed when they uh, when they use the bathroom elsewhere. So, like, you can spread more seeds and spread by wind and just to drop and spread. Um, uh, berry or mushrooms especially, you want to leave enough for the spores to spread. So uh, never take out a whole patch. Leave the smaller ones or the ones that look a bit off to, uh, to do their work. Um, always use a basket when picking mushrooms. I've seen that it's getting more popular on social media. A lot of people out using Sobeys bags. And I uh, came across it last year a few times. People in the woods with Sobe bags of mushrooms. And they don't cut them, they just haul them up out of the ground. And you try to tell them they're in the woods, and they're like, who are you to tell me not to use a Sobeys bag? So, it's, uh, yeah, you're, you're picking mushrooms with a basket. You're actually making more by spreading them in the woods. 
because they're drop the spores are going to drop in from the from the opens in the basket. But if you're using Sobey's bag, you're keeping the spores contained right in. And not to mention mushrooms rot very fast in plastic. So I don't know why anyone would do that. And uh, always use a sharp knife. I just go with the dollar store because I, I lose a lot of them. So um, yeah, you just uh, cut them at the base so they'll grow back and you're not disturbing the root system. Um, use a wicker basket, sharp knife, don't rip up the roots. Uh, and I just, I know people are really getting into mushrooms and they find it a bit scary. It's kind of uh, bad pictures where they're black and white. You could see them on the video a bit more. But uh, just, I got a few here that are really easy to identify. Uh, chanterelles, which are these, are really easy to identify. There's a false chanterelle, which you should really look up. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, once you get into these, uh, they're really easy to identify. They grow exceptionally good in Newfoundland. They can be found mid to late July until late September, early October. Last year I even found them at the end of November. It just seems like they're starting earlier and, and going later every year. Um, golden, they're golden yellow, many shapes early in the season. You get them really small and then er, this time of year they get really blown out and big. Um, they have gill-like ridges that fade into the stock. So like the gills are like a, a more of a false gill. It's not like a, a straight gill. They're all tangled up with each other and they go half and they fade into the stock whereas in the fall chanterelle as soon as the stock meets it to be like a perfect stop a perfect circle around the gills will not fade into the, the stem so that's a that's a really good tell um they have a fruity aroma uh they kind of got an apricot smell um Early in the season, they prefer. Uh, early in the season, you can find them on the edges of old uh, train tracks, uh, walking trails, logging roads, ATV tracks. You just walk them, and uh, they prefer like the earlier in the season. They're getting more sun, and later in the season, they'll move into the shade. So you find them a lot more commonly in like south-facing hills that are getting mixed light. So later, like this time of year, you got to do a lot of uh, crawling around and going up steep. Uh, uh, kind of steep hills close to the ocean are a really good place to find them. Um, hillside, they really like southern exposure. Uh, check under the juniper brushes and spruce boughs. Like a lot of times it looks like they're not there on the old trails, but you start lifting under the junipers and the spruce, you'll see that there's, there's a few mushrooms there. Um, look for old growth spruce and fir. So I find if you're looking for an area, it's a hill south facing, uh, you're getting a bit of mixed light in there. Um, and and uh, and you notice like part way down or toward the base, bottom of the tree, all the branches are dead. So they've dropped all the needles. All the needles have decomposed, turned into moss. Uh, so that's a really good tell of a place to look for them. Uh, beware the lookouts. We got the jack o' lanterns here. So they're a lot more of a straighter gill. Uh, like I said, as soon as it meets the stem, it'll stop really abruptly. It will not fade into it. Um, they usually have like a darker circle in the middle of them uh they don't grow really commonly here i found maybe you know a half dozen in you know five or six years of picking mushrooms but it is enough to be to make sure it's a thing and people aren't out picking those uh winter chanterelles are another one to come out after chanterelles uh they're much smaller than the chanterelle uh, they come out later in the fall when chanterelles slow down so you know you probably start seeing them like mid-september and then they'll go right till frost uh, usually even you can break them off in the frost. Um, same fork-like fork -like rigid gills which fade into the stem, but they have a dark gray brown cap. So the cap is a lot darker and the legs are much skinnier, but the, people call them yellow legs because the legs come down, they actually look like two, two legs together. So that's the winter chanterelles. They're really easy to identify. Uh, we're to find winter chanterelles, same, similar area as chanterelles, but they prefer dead, more decaying woods. So if you notice, there's a lot more dead branches and old trees that have fallen down in your chanterelle spots. Uh, there's a lot more rotting debris around. That's uh, more of a likely spot to find winters. Often on the edges where bogs meet spruce and fir. So if you're going to, through a forest and it meets a bog, it's good, good to check the bog right where the forest stops. Um, chaga. Chaga is a mushroom. It seems to be just getting popular here in Newfoundland, uh, which is crazy because it grows really well here in Central and the West Coast. So it's, uh, it's, it's around here, but uh, this fungus grows on old growth of birch trees in cooler climates. Known to have, it's known to have the highest recorded antioxidants of any natural food. 
Uh, it's a black woody charcoal looking mass protruding from the birch tree. It has a golden to rusty interior. And if you guys haven't seen this before, I, I got a uh, vending outside and I've got a lot of chalk out there if you guys want to come check it out. Uh, as an earth green, earthy green green tea taste when drank, and so it tastes a lot like a a green tea, but more of like an earthy, soily taste to it. Uh, it has a mocha flavor mixed with cream or chocolate, so uh, you can do some baking with it, and it'll kind of give a mocha taste. Or if you use cream in your if you're using it as a coffee, it'll give a mocha taste. It's found on birch trees, uh, found more in central Newfoundland, which has and the west coast has a greater population of birch. Most chaga will be found in multiple pieces on each affected tree, so it's common to find four or five pieces on one tree. Uh, often when you find an infected tree, others are nearby, so this, the spores are probably spread into other trees. And the chaga will start from a broken branch or an injury in the tree, and then the spores will spread and get into the tree, into the broken branch, and start inside the tree and work its way out. So a lot of these pieces that I'm picking are like 30 40 years old, so like you really want to let the smaller pieces grow. Um, sustainably harvesting chaga, increasing popularity with the health food craze. Chaga foraging could be come over uh, over harvested pretty easily if people get into this and start taking them from inside the tree. You really want to leave at least two or three inches of the exterior black mass on the outside of the tree if you're going to take it. And I usually just use a chisel and a hammer just so you can you can tell like where you're going to cut the tree off without taking too much of it. Um, most chaga we found are okay, always harvest in the winter when the tree is in dormancy. So if you harvest, you find a nice chaga patch, uh, come back to it in the winter or, in, or in early in the spring because you could kill the tree or the host by, by removing the chaga when the tree is not in its dormancy. Always make sure to leave two inches of the mushroom on the tree, never cut into the tree. Leave smaller pieces of chaga to grow. Don't over harvest chaga mushroom on the tree. Never harvest all the chaga too. You probably just want to take one or two chunks from each. Uh, hedgehog mushrooms are another common one that grow well here. You uh, find them a bit later than the, they'll start popping up maybe mid-September, a bit earlier. I found a couple maybe two weeks ago, but they were really early. But they're, they're another great mushroom that grow really well here. There are two varieties, the hedgehog and the sweet tooth. Uh, easy to identify by their spiny looking gills. Uh, so they actually, if you flip over, they look like a miniature hedgehog or a little hedgehog from the gills. And there is a really dark uh, variety. They say there is no poisonous varieties, but there's a real dark variety that grows here that I wouldn't eat. It's probably not poisonous, but it uh, has a really bad odor and taste. Um, sweet tooths have a creamy white color, and hedgehogs are creamy to brown in color. Sweet tooths are often larger than hedgehogs, so they're like a blown out version. They're very meaty. They go well in cream-based uh, pastas and soups, so they make a really nice cream of hedgehog soup. Uh, they grow well in stands of black spruce trees, and they grow later in the fall, uh, late September to frost. Also found where bog areas meet spruce and fir for similar to the winter chanterelles. And there's just some mix, uh, some berries that we we were putting in there, but we never finished. But uh, uh, they're just some of the more obscure berries here. Bake apples, uh, if you're familiar with bake apples, they grow really well in the bog. Uh, wind, sh wind stricken areas, uh, close to the ocean, they really like the salinity. Um, creeping snow berries are a little berry, I don't know if you've ever seen them. Uh, we'll show you some pictures. They look like little tic tacs, and they grow in similar areas as chanterelles. Um, they're really interesting berries, I'll show you some good pictures of those. And yeah, there's about it for the sustainable part, and we'll just show you some stuff that I've been foraging here, uh, this up the, up to as far as now. And uh, if anyone got any questions along the way, just stop me as we're going through the slide. Um, yeah. So we do have a. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Explode. All right. Sustainable foraging. Um, that's my cat Douglas. I don't know if you guys have ever seen him around. Uh, he, he, he comes around with me. So these are the chanterelles, hedgehogs, and the winter chanterelles. Um, why forage? We've been through all this. This is my cat Bernie in a big chanterelle patch. Um, so if we've been through all this, if anyone have any questions about it, just, just stop me. Uh, safe forage and tips, we've been through that. That's my uh, niece, Clara. She's uh, getting her started young. 
Uh, so this is SL pick in the chaga. That's the chaga we were speaking of. It's uh, really, really good for you. There's more antioxidants than anything on the planet. So any natural food, any blueberry, any blackberry, any dandelion greens, anything. Uh, it's really good for arthritis. It's got a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory properties. Um, once you get into reading about it, you get lost. Like I remember when I started reading about it years ago, I just spent like weeks and weeks researching chaga. Here it is, we're here picking it in the winter. And like you say, if you're gonna harvest this, this piece, you wanna leave at least two inches on the outside. So you just be end up with this chunk. Uh, Chaga did a beer with uh, Mill Street this year. It was a porter. It was a, I think it was Newfoundland's first mushroom beer. And uh, that was really, really good. They're gonna be doing that each year, I'm pretty sure. And uh, maple syrup, uh, that's pretty much the first Oh yeah, that's Bernice again, and this is my cat, Sean Terrell. Yeah, pretty crazy about cats too. I could... <laughs> uh, but maple syrup's kind of the first thing to get you back into the foraging. Uh, it's the kind of the first sign of spring for me. Um, when the trees, the first two or three days when the temperatures are above freezing and it still freezes in the night times, the maple syrup will start running. So it stores it all in the tap room for the winter. And then when that when that triggers the over the the days above freezing, it'll trigger the saps to send all the the sap that it has stored into the leaves to bring out the leaves. So you're pretty much just intercepting some uh, maple syrup that's going up the tree on the way up. So if you got a small tree, you only 16 inches around. You only want to put one tap in it. But if it gets four inches bigger each time the diameter, you can add up to four taps. So if you've got a great big honking maple tree in your yard, you can have four, four taps per tree. But uh, yeah, this is us. Uh, I do it to all my, all my neighbors on my street. I tap their, their maple trees. So I'll just give them a, a syrup and back and replace or eggs or whatever. Um, I really got into this year infusing my maple syrup. So I started making like, uh, I was picking a lot of winter cranberries this year because there wasn't snow. And it tastes really good in the winter. So I started just pouring the cranberries in the maple syrup as I was boiling it off and uh, just it, dumping them, straining them at the end and I leave you this really nice sweet uh, cranberry taste of maple syrup. I did a jalapeno one, a habanero one, uh, I did a chaga maple syrup which is really cool. Um, yeah, it goes really good on mousse. Um, what else? Uh, if you're using making maple syrup at home, you want to have a hood range because it gives off a lot of steam. And it, uh, you need to boil a lot. It's 40 liters to one liter for a maple syrup. And that's where it's a true sugar maples. I'm using like Norway maples and all different types of maples around here. So it really takes me like 80, 75, 80 liters for one liter of maple syrup. So it's a lot of work, it's a lot of boiling. But I do have a wood stove, I do it on my wood stove and it, there's no steam. So it's, uh, other than that, you really need to do it outside if you don't wanna do a lot of like long-term damage to your house. So if you have a wood stove, it's the best to do it on. And if you have propane, it works too, but uh, it's just so, like if you do it outside of propane, it's pretty expensive if you're going through a lot of propane. So wood, wood heat's like the only affordable way to do it. Uh, rose hips, kind of pick those. Uh, I'd pick those in the winter, maybe a little bit before the maple syrup, or you can pick them right from the fall on, really. As soon as they see frost, they taste sweeter. Uh, and that's the cat Douglas again. But uh, he comes out on adventures everywhere. Um, yeah, they're really good. They got a lot of uh, estrogen in them. So if people need, like, uh, women like uh, need some for an estrogen replacement, they make rose hip jelly. Um, uh, I did a beer with Mill Street this year too. I think it's here. Uh, they called it the Vinlander, and it was a saison with cranberry, winter cranberries, and rose hips. That was a really good beer too. Yeah, uh, you can do a lot of alcoholic beverages and stuff with all this stuff too when you get into it. Pretty cool. Uh, sting nettles is another good sign that uh, spring is coming. Um, the tips is what I usually harvest and I'll make pesto. So it, it makes a really, really nice pesto. And it's super simple. You just make it like a basil pesto, but you have to uh, um, give it a blanch. So you'll, the sting will go away. So you just blanch the nettles for like 30 minutes. No, no, sorry, 30 seconds to a minute. And then put it in an ice bath so it'll stay really green. If you don't put it in an ice bath, it'll turn them pale but it makes a beautiful pesto. Uh, I'll, I'll just do the tips early in the season, so when they're coming up everywhere like this, I'll just pinch off the tips. 
So you're just taking a whole new plant, which no one minds you picking sting nettles. So, you know, no one's going to be like, oh, you're over harvesting the sting nettles. <laughs> I got them everywhere. Yeah. You could, but they're a bit bitter because they're all gone to flower now. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I bit distract someone with a chicken walking down the... <laughs> Not something. Yeah. Yeah, right? It's definitely cross. I don't know. To get to the veg fest, I guess. <laughs> um, but the best thing about the tips is they're the tastiest at that point, and uh, there's not really any sting. Yeah. So if you catch them early in the season... So I, will, I do harvest them right up till they flower, so you really want to wear gloves. But uh, I, I don't feel sting nails sting because so, I pick so many of them. So my hand got a tolerance, but if it touches like the back of my arm or something, it'll sting right away. So you, you want to be careful picking them. But we make a wicked tea too. Um, we won the Savor Food and Wine Show this year with the sting nettle pesto. So we did the best, uh, best cold dish, me and uh, Adam from Five Brothers Cheese and Kevin from Old Dublin Bakery. He made a focaccia bread. I made the sting nettle pesto, and Adam made farm fresh cheese. And uh, yeah, that went over really good. Uh, alder's another good one to pick when, in the winter when the catkins, or just before the, cat, the flowers come out to drop the seed. There's uh, little cones on them. So you can just bust those up, collect them, dry them out to get the moisture out. You put them in a dehydrator or put them in your oven on a low heat with the door open. And then you just bust them up, and it makes a beautiful florally pepper. So it's like a really, really nice spice. Um, and they're really good for smoking meat too. You can just cut the branches off, strip the, strip like a, you got to dry them though to get the moisture out. And then just strip off the, the bark and everything. And you can press them into pucks or just put them into the uh, fire to smoke the meats. So that, that's a really good one too. Uh, seaweed, pick a lot of seaweed this winter when there's not much around. I was kind of like, what else can I get? So I started doing a lot of reading about edible seaweeds, which Newfoundland has a ton of. And they're super, super good for you. Full of calcium and magnesium. And um, yeah, these are ore weed. They go really good here. But if you're going to go after the seaweed, you want to not harvest stuff that's washed up on the beach because it could have been in the ocean for a long time. So it's probably up on the beach for weeks and weeks. So you really want to get in there. You probably need a wetsuit or something if you're not going to get it on a day when the tide's out. And you want to cut them off the rocks. So this is ore weed that I was picking for making seaweed. I mean, uh, pickles. So I just, I call them uh, sea olives. So I just cut the, cut the stems and pickle them and they're actually pretty surprisingly good. That's, uh, that's them here. They kind of look like olives. They're really good on like charcuterie plates or uh, I've seen a lot of restaurants buy them off and you put them into cocktails with like that seaweed gin. Um, dandelion buds, I pick a lot of these early in the season. Dandelion's one of my favorite because every part of the plant is edible. The roots you can make coffee out of. Uh, the these even before they get this big, when they before they they uh, reach up on the plant, you can collect them and use them as peas. And each plant has about five or six of them right off the early the season. So you can uh, you can just pick enough and freeze them that you can have have peas, use them as peas all season. But I I pick them when they come up on the before they flower, and I make capers. So you just pickle them in like a really salty brine, and it's a really really nice caper. And that's a root. That's uh, if you're gonna harvest the roots, you want to try to get the whole root out, or else you're gonna make more dandelions in your yard, which is cool with me, but a lot of people it's not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's really hard to take out the whole root. You want to use a shovel, a big shovel. Uh, you can see some of the roots are massive, but uh, if you're gonna clean this, it's the like biggest, the hardest part about it. You want to put them in a bucket of water for like a day or two, and then just scrub them, and they'll come off a lot easier when they're soft. And they make a really nice, healthy coffee substitute if you're trying not to drink caffeine and they're they go for a lot in health food stores if you go to buy dandelion root tea and they are everywhere Sean, yep. how do you make that? The, yeah you just um, just pick the root like I said you put it in the water wash it off and you make sure all the soil is off and I dehydrate mine in my dehydrator but if you just put it on the oven you can do this for any harvest put your oven on the lowest setting on a baking tray with the door open and for like four to six hours and it'll dry it out and then you take it up and you put it in a coffee grinder and bust it all up and it just looks like coffee and um, picking the flowers I did another beer with Dan, uh, Mill Street <laughs> lots of beer yeah um, 
it's supposed to be healthy practice for regime, but <laughs> I'm not wasting away to anything. Um, yeah, I was picking these for a beer. You can make really nice meads. Uh, I pick them for a lot of restaurants that make sugar. Like Raymond's will make the dandelion the flower sugar. They'll just blitz it with sugar. Um, I heard of uh, one of the ladies that did my tour this weekend. Their grandmother used to make dandelion jelly. So used to make them out of the flowers. Um, this is a this is a dandelion root spice cake we did with uh, last forger's dinner I did with Fix. And we just made it the same as a carrot cake but with the dandelion root. And it was really, really, really good. Uh, that's just river mint, wild river mint on it. And it's actually uh, chaga powder, all, chaga sugar all over the top. Uh, that's the dandelion IPA, the one we just did. At, I think it was sold out in like three weeks or something. It was really, really good beer. And the, the root gave it a really nice bitterness for the IPA. Uh, these are more L's. They don't usually grow here on the Avalon, but this year I found a lot of more L's that were coming in on the garden mulch from the west coast of Newfoundland. So I found them. Uh, my friend Kathy gave me a call and she's like, Oh, what are these growing in my yard? And she sent me a picture. I was like, I'm on the way right away. <laughs> Drop everything. And sure enough, they're, they're growing up in her mulch everywhere. So I got Kathy to call the landscaper that got the mulch. And he, he called the company, or he told me what company he got the mulch from. And I just kind of figured out what landscaping jobs he had done here before. So I just went around and I found a lot in the mulch. There's a lot of scores, yeah. And I've never had a morel like my whole life foraging. I've just been drooling over morels on the internet. So it was excellent. They cook really good. Here's one of Jeremy using some of these cookbooks that he's coming out with now. Uh, this is uh, stuffed with a really sharp cheddar. So we just stuffed the morels with cheddar cheese, uh, which is not probably a thing, good thing to say in veg fest. But uh, I mean, it's vegan cheese we stuffed it with. Yes. Uh, but you can stuff it with anything, you know. You don't have to be cheese, but it's really good. And we just put them on the barbecue, and they're super meaty. Uh, this is everyone's most dreaded weed. Uh, everyone familiar with the bamboo that grows everywhere? It's the, everyone hates it. If you got it in your yard, you absolutely despise it. Uh, but uh, I eat it all the time. Uh, when I first got into uh, foraging and selling it to the restaurants and everything, every year I would try to pick these because I knew they were edible. And everything I read was saying I'd use them like asparagus. So every year I try to get them, but they grow so fast that I usually miss the season. So uh, they're called, uh, people call them mile a minute. They're Japanese knotweed is the real name, but they literally grow a mile a minute. And uh, I, I, when I finally caught them, I used them like asparagus, like the book said, 15 centimeters, and I thought they were awful, like the worst thing I ever had. They're really like sour. They didn't go good as a asparagus at all. And then uh, next year came around, and I just said, "Geez, I'll try to get them a bit earlier when they're not fibrous." So these, like before, when they get a little bit bigger than this, they'll get hollow and they'll get really fibrous. But when they're this size, they're like an excellent rhubarb, but a bit more sour. So they're really, really good. Make jams out of them and compotes. They go really good on uh, pork, like the jam. Put it on pork, which is, I gotta forget my audience here. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Do not put this on meat. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's so passionate. So I just start saying everything I do with it. But uh, yeah, I've seen Fix. They make uh, olives, like little olives that they serve with everything. Uh, what else have I seen done with these? Uh, at the forager's dinner, we did a savache that uh, that actually cooked the scallops because there's so much acidity in the in the um, in the Japanese knotweed. So like you usually use lemon juice or whatever, but we just sub, uh, sub put that in place of it. Uh, but yeah, they're a really good one. They grow everywhere. If you're picking these, just make sure you're not uprooting them because they can spread a bit more. But like I really wouldn't wouldn't worry about it because they spread like crazy anyway. It's just eat them when they're young. You're probably going to, if you just continuously eat them and harvest them, you're going to slow down the process. Uh, fireweed, this is probably my favorite uh, spring shoot. It's uh, another really invasive species like we've been talking about, the dandelions, the Japanese knotweed, so you really don't need to worry about over harvesting these, like the mushrooms and berries. Um, so these are fireweed. I see, they're on the highway everywhere now. They're really pink flower. I know people know some you get people confuse them for lupin. Okay, keep going through the thing. We run out of time. Uh, but they really have a garlicky taste. So uh, cu uh, cut them when they're young and fry them, and the tops will kind of crisp like a kale chip. 
and the bottoms are kind of like a garlicky asparagus. Uh, these are maple flowers. A lot of people don't see them because they come out at the same time as the first few leaves, but they're really sweet and have a little bit of a maple taste. Uh, Kenny from Cedo did a maple sauce, uh, a maple maple flower salsa verde, which is really good. Uh, this is river mint. Commonly grows in rivers. Uh, just make sure the streams are running. If there's rivers running in the ocean, you can usually chase them, trace them back and find some river mint growing on there. Um, uh, this is Roger from East Coast Glow. He does a lot of uh, natural uh, plant-based uh, soaps and uh, hair, hair skin products, stuff like that. So he buys a lot of wild, wild edibles off me. Uh, these are wild hops. They grow really commonly from old homesteads. So a lot on the East Coast Trail and Southern Shore, there's a lot of notice. If you find a spot with old rock foundations that no houses are there anymore, try to search around. They grow up pin, pin tree stands a lot and take over like whatever they're growing next to. Um, that's the pickled hops. Uh, oyster leaf, which is a beach green. Rhubarb, which is not a wild plant, but I pick in a lot of old homesteads. It's the most wasted thing in people's property. Nobody uses it. I, lock, I knock on a lot of people's doors and picked a rhubarb and they're usually like, guess what you go for. Um, that was a rhubarb ice cream my friend made, which was amazing. Uh, this guy here is in the audience right now. Yeah. Uh, this is us picking some cattails, which is a wild plant. We fell into the water. Uh, sorrel, one of my favorites. It's got really lemony taste. It's, it's around right from spring right till now. So, like, if you... It's really hard to get lemongrass here in Newfoundland, so like if you use want anything with a lemony taste, there you go. And lemons are super expensive. Spruce tips is an excellent one. They're long gone now, but yeah, you can do mignonettes, vinegars, uh, pickles. I use them as rosemary. I just dry them. That's a seafood spice I did or a trout spice. It's just spruce tips, Scotch lovage, which grows on the beach, and Newfoundland sea salt. And that, I don't know how that got in there. That's mustard that I was growing in my greenhouse. <laughs> Not such a wild thing. That's what me and Freddie were picking, the cattails. It's a wild leek. They kind of look like uh, hot dogs on the top now when they're flowering. But they're really, really oniony. Nice taste. Kind of a cucumber taste, actually. That's uh, Jesse. Um, he was, we did a forager's dinner, and he used a lot of those. Um, some more beach greens is the Scotch Lovers that went into the trout spice. Uh, this was a... A bowl that they did at uh, the grounds. This is red dulse, the seaweed. Bake apples, which we picked this year for another beer. Um, chanterelles, which are out right really, now really well. Um, it's a really good picture of chanterelles. You can see how it, they don't stop right here. They'll fade, not abruptly, they'll fade into the stem. More chanterelles, lots of chanterelles. Uh, dewberries, it's a, a lot of people call these mountain raspberries. They grow here, they're a lot harder to find, but they're one of my favorite berries. Uh, this is a wild red currant, a skunk currant. And wild strawberries, probably like the most flavor packed into one little berry there is. Uh, raspberries, I got a lot of fresh raspberry jam uh, out at my booth there if you want to stop out after this. Uh, chanterelles, there's me and Dougie in picking chanterelles. <laughs> How does my cat not lose me? <laughs> um, no, he's, he's been doing, I've been having him out in the woods since he's like four weeks old. Like I'm super young. And he was a stray cat my friend found behind Tilt House Bakery in the cove. And I just had him in my pocket until he couldn't fit in my pocket. And now he's a pretty chill cat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I got a dinner coming up at Fork if anyone's interested. These forger's dinners, uh, it's just I go around for a full week. Pick uh, pick everything, bring it to the head to the head chef, and they'll make a, a five course meal out of all the random things you bring in. Um, dates, times, all yada yada yada. All right, cool, we're done. Awesome.